Hi, everybody. I'm Krista Olson from South Carolina. Like Marilyn said, I am a teacher of the visually impaired and have been a technical assistant for the South Carolina DeafBlind Project for the last six years. Um, I've got a lot of information to share today. I'm going to cover um, the five W's. I'll probably throw an H in there for how and a couple of other letters relevant to cal calendar systems um, and try to give you just a good brief overview. And then I really want to show you calendars in action. So bear with me while we go through this. I am a fast talker and I'm going to try to slow it down as much as I can. So these are just the objectives. I'm not going to read these out loud to you, but you just get some basic understanding of calendar systems. When I refer to calendar systems, um, I'm looking at this as a very broad idea. So it's really a way to help facilitate communication. So we're going to look, of course, at the structure of a calendar system, but I also want you guys to see how that can expand out to other modes of communication or communication needs. <laughs> so, and before I get into the really, Big details, I wanted to just give you guys the basic calendar system format because you'll see them in a lot of pictures throughout these slides. And so just so you have an idea, um, generally the calendar systems are set up to go left to right. If you expand beyond there, they're going to go top to bottom. So much like a traditional calendar, like a wall calendar. Um, the other piece that's unique that you'll see in both of these pictures. So the picture on the left has four boxes in front and then a box behind it. That's the finished box. It looks a little bit different. That one is uh, lined with a lighter paper, it looks like. And on the right picture, we have three separate boxes and then like a hot pink box on the right. And that's also a finished box. And so that is one thing that's going to be in every picture is going to be some kind of finished indicator. <clears throat> So we're gonna start with the big one, why calendar systems? Um, I know we've got a lot of people on this call, so it's gonna be hard to get some of that group participation, but if you look um, at the bottom right, there's a picture of a Google calendar set up <clears throat> with all the color coding and all of the appointments. And we think about our own lives and how much we depend on our devices. I don't know how I would make anything on time if I didn't have my phone, my work calendar, <laughs> and my Alexa enabled devices that I'll probably activate by saying that out loud now. Um, they are my reminders for everything. So we have to remember that as adults, we do this all the time. And so this is really just a way to start getting our students and children that same kind of support that everybody naturally needs. This is not unique to a child with dual sensory loss. Um, so this is going to help facilitate communication. It's going to provide objects, words, textures, things that will help increase the understanding of what's going on throughout their day and what, throughout their world. So that can help facilitate making choices. It can help facilitate some of the older skills, transition skills. And I'm hoping to show you some examples of all of that towards the end. Um, it reduces negative behaviors and provides emotional support. And so when we think about, um, usually as a deafblind project, when we get calls from a school, it's often because there's a behavior issue. Um, and so many times it has to do with our kids are often dragged from one place to another or things happen around them, but it's not explained to them in a way that's accessible for them. And so they get a little upset because, you know, they might be doing an activity they really like, and there's no indication that that's going to be ending soon, but all of a sudden they're being forced and pulled away to do the next thing. So this kind of helped pr provide a concrete way for them to understand what's happening throughout their day, <laughs> excuse me. Um, it also helps increase literacy. So as we build the calendar system, we can build the vocabulary and the words and a way for them to both input and output those things. So um, whether, you know, these are all like left to right, top to bottom, those are reading skills. So super helpful. Um, it's going to teach time and positional concepts. So before, after, now, next, in front of, in back, you know, behind. So we get a lot of those really good positional uh, concepts built into the calendar system and it builds in other academic and life skill concepts. And so again, I have some videos and some pictures at the end that I'm hoping will help solidify that for you so that you can see how this can expand. Um, but even just things as simple as counting the amount of things, activities that you have throughout the day is a math skill. So, um, we can usually usually use these to build in quite a bit of stuff. 
going to the next slide. So who uses a calendar system? So <clears throat> we talk a little bit about this um, here, we, you know, before I talked about how everybody uses some form of a calendar system. So this isn't really exclusive to any specific population, um, but all kids can benefit from a calendar system. So even in a gen ed classroom, if you walk in, a lot of the times the day is laid out either on the whiteboard or the smart board or somewhere in the classroom, what that schedule is for the day. Oftentimes our kids just don't have access to that. And sometimes it's not meaningful to them. And so we wanna make sure that we are giving them access and we're giving them things that make sense for them. And of course, teachers and families are a huge part of that. So when we talk about the calendar system in this context, of course, we're talking about children or adults with dual sensory loss, um, but the people that work with those children are a huge piece of that implementation. So calendars can be used anywhere that a child needs to know what's coming next. So we can use them in the home and I'm hoping to show you at least examples of each of these types of things. We're gonna see them in schools. We might see them in therapies, whether that be private or school-based and we might see them on the go. So if you have a kid that's um, going to one therapy to the next, this is something that they might have to support those transitions. And where is the calendar placed? So we're going through these W's pretty quickly, but that's because I want to get to the meat of some of this information. The calendar needs to be within the student's reach and or sight line. Um, if anybody on this call happened to see Chris Russell present this morning, he spoke about sometimes we set up a calendar system or a system for communication and some of the things are too high for the kid to reach. Um, oftentimes, even as a, as a parent, it's easy to do for with a kid than to have them be a part of the process. But for these purposes, they our kids need to be in the process. Whatever level of participation we can get, we want to get. So it needs to be where they can see it or where they can touch it or both. Um, we should not be removing the items for them and, and manipulating it for them unless they need that level of physical assistance. Um, so that where can be really, really important. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of aware so that you guys can see just different ways that people have implemented. So this is a stationary system. It's a box calendar system. Uh, if you look on the right, um, that would be the finished box. It's got a little bit of a different visual feel to it. It looks like it's bigger than the rest of them, but it's in one place, probably in the back or near that student's workstation um, where they can actually go and manipulate it. This next one is an example of a wall system. So again, we're looking at that left to right, um, uh, hopefully at a height where that child can reach it. So I can't speak for the age of the child in this classroom, but I would like to assume that it's in a place where they can actually touch and manipulate the items. And then calendars on the go. So this is one that's a little bit different in the sense that it's gotta be accessible in a, in a smaller format usually. So if a child is changing classes, if they have a lot of appointments or therapy sessions, um, if they're going to a lot of multiple locations, this is going to be a lot easier for them to manipulate. And so I just have a couple of examples of those as well. This one is on an all-in-one board. So for my teachers of the visually impaired that are on this call, this is available through the American Printing House um, with quota funds. And so this is a felt board basically, but and the other side has a white board on it if you've never used one. But this is looking like it was particularly used for meal time and possibly maybe some choice time. And so um, she may, you know, the student might eat the cereal first and then do something in, you know, that corresponds to that pink polka dotted paper and then get to listen to music um, and then put their spoon in, you know, the dishwashing area. Um, so this is just one system that could be carried for a child that might need some bigger items. This is another system and this is just a binder system. Um, so this has got the days laid out, it's got Velcro and then that child can also put a star as they're on an activity, which could mean this is what I'm doing right now. This is another portable system and this is what often most of us adults are using, which is a system on your phone. And so if a child is ready for that or uh, a young adult, by all means, 
we can use some of the more mainstream technologies to use a calendar system. So what I kind of want to demonstrate here is that there is no one set in stone way to implement a calendar system. Um, it's going to be evolving and changing over time to meet the students' needs, depending on what they're doing. So when do we use a calendar system? Um, this is a pretty hefty list here, but we always want to use one at the start of the day. And let me preface this by saying, and we're going to talk about types of calendar systems, but let me start by saying the kid has to have some level of meaning and understanding of what these symbols are for this to be effective. And we'll talk about creating that. But once you have a system in place, this is how you want to use it. So you may look at it at the start of the day and set up all of the events for the day. This is what we're doing. Having said that, that should not be your only trip to the calendar throughout the day. So you want to go back to that calendar system at every transition. When you're starting a new activity, when you're ending an activity, sometimes within the activity, and I will show you some examples of a calendar system or a communication system within an activity, the end of the day. So the end of the day is the great, a great time to go through your finished basket and say, these are all the things that we did today. Let's talk about them. What was your favorite thing that we did? Or can you help me put these things up for tomorrow? Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can engage a student during that time. And then the other piece that's really important is we can use these calendar systems when there's a change or a disruption in the day. So if you know a field trip is canceled due to weather, we can use our calendar system to show the child in, an, in a very concrete way that we're not going to be doing what was originally scheduled. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So this is just when I talked about calendar systems within an activity, this is just a step-by-step -step, um, for a child who is using visual communi uh, communication picture symbols of how to, you know, when his calendar says it's time to pack your backpack, he's got this separate, you know, little system within his calendar that shows him what the steps are to have that completed. Um, again, when I said, when I talk about calendar systems, I'm going to be using it in that broad sense of a tool for communication and to build more concepts. So this is just one example of this. So this picture has a backpack and that indicates that the child will be packing their backpack. Um, and then they have to put their iPad in and their pencil case and their lunchbox. And then the bottom has a spot for if the child is very time oriented, you may say, you need to finish this by 1230. Um, and that might be what time you put on the bottom. If the child really does well with timers, we may put, you have five minutes to do this, um, whatever system is working with that child. So again, very, very individualized in that sense. So the next piece is picking what we're going to put in that calendar system. I'm gonna drive this home a couple of times, but the best way to find out what you're putting into a calendar system is assessment. Assessment, assessment, assessment. And that can come in the form of observation. Um, it can come in the form of some formal tools. You definitely, if you're a parent wanting to start this, you wanna make sure you're in communication with the school team and you guys can share resources and ideas um, to help develop that system, rely on some of the expertise of the professionals. And that goes, the same way with professionals, please make sure that you're including the families in these conversations because they're going to know a lot about what their child is experiencing as well. And so they may be able to help you pick more appropriate symbols. So some examples of assessments, and we could do full trainings on these alone, so I'm just going to touch on them, are the learning media assessment, which is the typical tool for a teacher of the visually impaired with usually an academic student, determining whether they are tactile, visual, or auditory learners. Um, the other one is the sensory learning kit, and that looks at kids with more complex communication needs, and we look at all of the sensory channels. Um, so we may be incorporating scent into the calendar system or movement into their calendar system. And so it gives us just a good idea of what materials the child can access and what they're interested in. So these are just some examples of different kinds of calendars. So this is a whole object calendar system stationary on a wall. Um, you can see that there's a toilet paper roll very likely used for toileting on the calendar system. 
Uh, we have a ball, we have a real book, we have a spoon. Um, it looks like there is a guide to what some of those symbols are on the up below it with pictures, but this is for a child that may need whole objects to manipulate and hold to know what's coming next. These are either mini symbols or uh, partial symbols. And so you'll see um, there's a little maraca for music, a little switch plate for computers, a little half ball for recess, uh, half a paintbrush for art, and then a full but miniature ball for PE. Um, I would say, again, when you're working with the team, uh, you will develop what is the most appropriate thing for that child. For some children, miniatures might not be appropriate. Um, if a child is is only a tactile learner, some of those miniatures will probably not match up with what they experience the world in the world. So we want to be very deliberate when we're choosing those items. Um, and you'll also see on this picture, there's the all done space for when they're finished with an activity. Um, as much as possible, when we're manipulating the calendar, we're going to go there first. We're going to say, oh, music is coming up next. Let's take our music symbol with us and we'll bring it to the activity. And we're going to do the activity and then bring it back with us, the, the symbol, and put it in the finish box and say, okay, we finished music and maybe have a conversation about music and then go, okay, what's next? And the next empty spot on there will be the computers. And so that's kind of the basic general idea. Of course, you might want to build in more prompts as needed. You may build in other vocabulary, depending again on the student's needs. This is a symbol system. These are some half and partial objects, but also some abstract symbols like the circle and the star might not necessarily connect directly to that exact object. Um, the big important component of choosing these items, whether it be tactile items or print or anything, is that the child has meaning attached to them. So we wouldn't pick a miniature toilet bowl or um, a miniature bus to represent a bus because that's not what our children are experiencing. We want to make sure whatever it is that they're touching, whatever it is that they're able to see or hear is how we're incorporating that into the system. This is another example of a visual schedule. So these are just uh, picture symbols. There is print on the top of most of these. The print is typically not for the child using the system, but it's for consistent language for the team. So it's making sure that everybody that goes to that calendar system with the student is using the same words and the same phrasing. So um, that's just one example of that. And that has a combination of symbols. There's the sign for Friday. There's a picture of a check, um, lots of different, a combination of real and abstract ish symbols, but they're all pict uh, pictures, not drawing or not photographs. Below that, you'll see there's one that has a time clock and it looks like the student was expected to put whatever the activity was uh, at that time in the space next to it. So if a child can take some ownership again in filling out their calendar or choosing activities, it's going to make it a more meaningful tool for them. This is an example of a digital or electronic format. So this, and I'm not sure if the app is still available, was an app called iPrompts. And this is again, a routine within a routine. So the child might find toothbrush on their calendar, but then have this mini routine or calendar within that activity. Um, the cool thing about iPrompts that if it still exists is you could check off the activities as you go, but it also has this nice color coded timer. So if a child can visually access that, they can also see if time is running out um, and they need to move on to the next activity. Krista, this is Robert. We have yes. a comment in the chat box I was gonna insert right here if I could. Please. This is from Jay. It says, most of these systems require students to know the left and right concepts because they go from left to right. I've seen a lovely system that stacks. So the top one is the only one that is reachable and top is always the next activity. This was invented by an OT. Um, I have not seen a system like that, but I would never, if it meets the child's needs, I'm never going to be opposed to something like that. So if the child has mobility that really limits them or might find motor skills to being able to pull off the top, I think that's great. Um, in the in this reference, we talk more about that typical left to right, top to bottom, because we're looking at kind of that literacy skill. But again, I'm a big fan of customizing. So um, like you see in this little activity here, this is a top to bottom. So, and I'm sure there's other ones that you could set up to where once you check it up, uh, check it off, the rest of them raise up so that there's not visual clutter for a child who might be accessing this visually. 
And just a real quick reference, almost all of this information is in this book, The Calendars Book by Robbie Blahob, that is also available from American Printing House if you order the calendars kit. Um, but it's a wonderful resource. It has checklists about how to start a system, what level to start at, um, picking materials. So if you don't have a copy of this, I highly, highly recommend it. This is just another example. Um, this is, looks like a portable system, so it can be on a clipboard. As he finishes the activities, he can put a sticker on them. Um, some of some teachers prefer to laminate so that they can reuse a sheet over and over again. Some prefer, prefer to just do them so that they can be thrown away. Um, also wonderful for data keeping. So if you do have it like this, uh, where you could keep them, you could hold on to them and kind of see trends, which is wonderful in, in the education component. This next one is a braille calendar. And so this is a more basic one. First, we're going to do this, then we're going to do this next thing. Um, I was fortunate when I first started teaching to be in a classroom where I had 11 students all on individualized cal calendar systems and about five of them were, were braille systems. And then I had a couple of photo systems and print systems. And so um, again, super customizable depending on a child's needs. And if you're working with the team to, de to determine what's going to work for them. So we talked about picking objects and assessing, but when you actually really wanna get down to the nitty gritty, the first thing that you'll do after the assessment is map out your child's day. Um, see what's consistent throughout those days. Make, and, and if you're not consistent there, that's your starting point. If you don't really have a schedule, that might be where you need to start before building a physical system. You may need to start with just having some activities that happen regularly that we can work on anticipation with. Um, but if your child does have a very rigid or somewhat set schedule, um, you wanna choose something that's going to facilitate success first. So if your child hates to eat, do not make the first item in your calendar system associated with mealtime because <laughs> they're not going to wanna go near that system. So you wanna find something that's motivating to start with. If they love to eat, by all means, go for it. If your child hates diaper change or hates being wet, they don't mind the diaper change, but they hate being soiled. You may start with diapering and changing because you want to make sure that again, they're gonna be motivated by this system. Um, I always say don't bite off more than you can chew. So we're gonna talk about the different levels of calendar systems, but I also wanna just preface, especially for families and for teachers that are working with multiple children, um, if you pick five items to start and you're trying to be super rigid and you are feeling overwhelmed, your child is feeling overwhelmed as well. So do this in a way that's manageable. So you may start with just one item and that might be the consistent thing that you do throughout the day. Um, and if you have to set up an activity that you can do several times a day, that's okay. Um, but then you'll go ahead and follow through with that. And then once you start to see them recognizing and making connections with those symbols, you may add another one in. And so again, no, if you know your child or your student um, and you know your comfort level, don't make this something that feels like a really heavy task because it'll be discontinued as quickly as you started it. <laughs> um, and the next component is making sure that those items are meaningful. So we talked a little bit about those models. Um, we just really need to make sure that the child is somehow engaged or recognizes what that symbol is supposed to be as First. we build in that meaning. And so sometimes we're going to find things that don't have a symbol that goes along with it. And I always give this example of my first year teaching, I had a student who really needed a calendar system. And I talked to the teacher and I said, well, what, you know, what's an activity that he enjoys? And he says, well, we go for a walk outside every day. And he really likes that. And I said, okay, great. What does he touch? Cause this child had no vision. Um, and I believe some hearing loss at that time as well. And he said, well, he doesn't touch anything. He just walks. And I said, well, I can't really put sidewalk on a calendar system because one, it's heavy and cumbersome. And two, he's not really touching that. He's just kind of walking on it. Um, so let's start making something meaningful. So maybe every time you guys go outside, have him touch the same tree. And then we could possibly pull some of that bark from the tree and use it for his calendar system. Um, the funny follow-up to that story is the teacher actually pulled a whole branch off the tree to give to me the next time I came in. <laughs> and he said, is this what you're talking about? So 
we tweaked it a little bit, but, um, but there are going to be things that we're going to need to build in meaning for, and that's okay. So this is just an example of some different symbols. Um, I would love for some audience participation. So if you want to throw some things in the chat pod and Robert and or Dana or Marilyn want to throw the answers at me, um, these are different ways to represent a bus. So can you give me an example of a student who might be able to use the picture symbols on the left? Hey, Krista, this is Deanna. I'm just waiting to see. I'm looking in the chat box. And I do see a comment about the iPrompt. I'll have to check into that app. Um, I had a, a couple of students using it a couple of years ago, but I'm not sure if it was discontinued. And somebody said they had heard of the seat covering. So, um, so I'm getting some answers. So for the symbol on the left, um, I'm starting to get some answers. Somebody said maybe a hearing a child with a hearing loss um, or somebody who can see an unidentified meeting. Um, so the left one is going to be for somebody who's got some some functional vision who might understand line drawings and symbols like that. That middle item is the whole harness. So for anybody who's had a younger child who's been on a bus, um, they often will have a full harness. And so that might be a really good symbol for a child who is using a harness, who's just beginning to make connections for symbols. Um, and then that one on the right could potentially be for the same child, but we've made the symbol smaller. So we're starting to see possibly a progression in the use of symbols, or this could be for a child who already has made some symbolic meaning um, connections, but now we just need to find a symbol for bus. So, um, and then there's other things that we need to think about. So is the symbol just going to mean bus or is it going to be getting in a car in general? So if we pick that seatbelt material, we need to be very careful that we use language that pairs with what we want it to mean. So if it's going to be for travel in general, we may not say this is your bus symbol. Um, but if it is only being used for that and we have another symbol for when they're going home with their mom in the car, um, we may want to, you know, vary that up depending on the child's understanding. So now we're going to get a little bit more into types of calendars. So the first type of calendar, and it's in the calendars book, is an anticipation calendar. And this is the very start. And so what I had mentioned before is if your child does not have any kind of symbolic meaning or you don't have any set routines, you may want to set up a routine before you start an anticipation calendar. Um, but the piece of this is this is that starter calendar. What you'll see in the picture is on the left side, there's an item. It's inside of what looks like a mesh bowl. Um, and then on the right is a yellow plastic basket. And so they are, these things are going to actually be brought to the child or to the space where they're going to be doing the activity. And it's going to be set up left to right. And we may use hand under hand or encourage them to reach in and grab the item depending uh, we're going to help label that item. We're going to do that activity immediately. So we shouldn't have a whole lot of time between when they're encountering that item and when they actually do the activity because we want to build that symbolic meeting. And, um, when we're finished, we're going to take that same item from that container and we're going to put it in our finish box. So again, this may require some hand manipulation depending on the child's needs. As much as humanly possible, we want to use hand under hand, of course. Um, and again, we're going to be working on learning the idea that there's a beginning and an end to an activity. Um, we're reinforcing some of those literacy skills. We're giving the child information about what's happening um, and it's happening within their space. So this is specifically for just one routine at a time. But again, we're going to build that meaning up to be able to expand on those concepts. <clears throat> So the next thing is a daily calendar. Now I have a couple of little bullet points about readiness or ideas that go along with these calendars. These are expanded on much more in that calendars book. I just wanted to give you all a general feel. Um, 
So a daily calendar is going to represent multiple routines. So once we have the anticipation calendar, kind of maybe we're looking at three or five items that the child is really familiar with, we may start wanting to sequence them. And so the picture that you see here is um, a desk calendar. It looks like kind of a felt material and then it's every activity is separated by a string and there's a finished box on the top right. Um, it looks like they're using different types of tactile uh, symbols in this one. But this is a way to start um, kind of solidifying that certain activities happen on certain days. And so we have multiple routines within there, but maybe on PE day, uh, which may be Mondays of every week, we're going to put that PE symbol in the specials spot. Um, and we're going to start to build that meaning that, you know, Mondays are PE. And then Tuesday, maybe we're putting in the art symbol. So we have these objects cues that start to represent different events. And that's going to be important for our next step. <laughs> but right now, this is just giving us a layout of the day. We start to look at time and distance. So we could even say, look at the beginning of the day, we're going to start with circle time, but look at what's happening all the way. Let's go all the way to the end of our calendar. Oh, the end of the day, we're gonna have choice time or time outside. So we get to look at that, that space and distance and how it represents something a little bit more abstract, but we have this concrete way of explaining it. Krista, this is Dana. There's a question in the chat box that says, with the anticipation calendar, is the item in the bowl the activity they are doing or an object that represents the activity? It's a good question. It can be both. <laughs> so um, there are going to be some activities where the object can't be used within the activity. It's just a symbolic representation, like if we're using a partial of something. Um, however, if they're using real objects and it can be used as part of the activity, by all means, may, again, it's another way to build meaning for that child. Um, I would just definitely recommend if whenever you think about choosing those symbols or whatever it is, is it something that one, you're gonna be using consistently if that's what you're gonna use within the activity as well, um, and that you have multiples of it. So, because you may start be needing to use it as a symbol system or as a communication piece. And so you wanna make sure that you aren't limiting yourself to one item that you can't find anywhere else. <clears throat> but I hope that answers that question. I, again, my big belief in calendar systems is that they're very flexible. So if you can make it work within the activity, please do. So we talked a little bit about that daily calendar system and some of the vocabulary that we might start to reinforce there is the finished, the now, later, before, wait, change. So we might start building in those vocabulary concepts and that is all going to feed beautifully into a weekly calendar. So the picture we have here <clears throat> is just a regular day of the week, but you can see there's a blue outline along <clears throat> excuse me, the activities that are happening within one day, the, the, the now, the today. Um, and if you look at the top, there's like little yellow cards on the left and the right of that blue. Um, and those are yesterday and tomorrow. So it starts again to build those time concepts. The other thing you'll notice is we have not abandoned the daily calendar. Um, this particular calendar is set up to where the daily calendar is represented vertically top to bottom. So we're going weekdays left to right, and then activities within the day, top to bottom. <clears throat> and the fun thing with this is if you're doing this as like an object system or even a visual system, when we talked about like if we chose a ball for PE and a paintbrush for art, <clears throat> excuse me, and bells for music, we can start to represent Monday by the ball. Like, because we know PE always happens on Mondays. And on Tuesdays, we have the paintbrush because Tuesdays is art, but we can start to associate consistent events with that day of the week. So it helps again, solidify those concepts um, and starts to reinforce the days of the week as well. And then we can move to a monthly calendar. So this might include multiple weeks in the picture that we see here. Um, it looks like, again, we're set up as a typical calendar. So it may be um, Monday through Friday for school days on there. And then every row is a different week. And so there's a red ribbon through the two weeks that have already happened. And there's a green band around the current week. Um, and so this is again, going to increase some of our vocabulary. This calendar is going to be um, for a kid that might be learning the names of the months, how to write a date, um, 
all of that fun stuff. And this doesn't have to happen in one shot either. So if you are transitioning from a weekly calendar to a monthly calendar, you don't have to just have it all set up for four weeks right away. You can say, let's do one week and then we're going to expand to two weeks and then we're going to expand to three weeks. And so again, we're going to let the child set the pace in some of those circumstances, but we're going to just be really, really deliberate about how we build that system for them. And this of course can transition into an annual calendar. Um, So then we want to, you know, look at how we're going to tweak or get that level of information in there. So it's really just, again, flexible. (laughs) So showing changes on a calendar, we talked a little bit about this. So there are a couple of ways that people like to demonstrate that something has changed. So if something is canceled, the symbol on the right is that circle with a line through it. Um, You may have those kind of on hand with your system and you may put that on top of that activity and say, we're not going to do that today and give the reason why. Um, If you're using boxes, you may close the lid on a box that is an activity that's canceled. We may have the child. And again, the key to this is engaging the child, have that child place that activity in the all done basket. You know, I know we didn't get to do this today, but we're not going to be able to. So let's go ahead and put that in the all done basket and let's put something else in its place or let's move on to the next activity. So um, that's another way. And then another way to make that whole process meaningful, again, is having the child be a part of it. So if this child is able to load their own calendar and put the events in, awesome. Let them do it (laughs) because then they have some ownership over what's happening. And then the next piece is just making it work. So I've said it a couple of times, let the child set the pace. I know we heard uh, David Brown talk about Jan Van Dyke and the idea of follow the child. Um, That applies to just about every aspect of working with children with dual sensory loss and it does not change for this. Um, It is okay for your child to stay on one type of system or one type of symbol for a while if they're not ready to move on. Um, Some kids may pick up a calendar system in a week or two and be ready to kind of expand past that. Um, Some kids may need a year to just work with one type of system. So again, we're just gonna pace it depending on the child as long as we're building that communication. Make time for the calendar. And I'm hoping with some of the examples that I give you in a little bit, you can see that this is not just talking about our day. This is our day. This facilitates communication. It helps facilitate understanding. It helps build literacy concepts and math concepts. Um, And this is where I find sometimes the buy-in can be very hard when you're a teacher that has a lot of students with a lot of needs. Um, And so I often say, let's talk about, you know, I hate to to put it in this perspective, but when we look at state testing, um, most alternative testing allows for real objects. So I always say, this is a great way to build those things in so that you're not showing them, which you're not allowed to do anyway, the object the first time when they're taking the test. Let's start building some of those things that we know are going to be included into their calendar system. So they're getting regular exposure to it. Um, again, not my favorite way to get buy-in for a calendar, but um, but I do understand the constraints of, of being in a classroom and having limited time. And so consider this a tool for all of your curriculum. Allow this to be a time and place to increase communication. So if you have a lot of transitions, if you're going to specials and lunch and therapy, um, make sure you're given a couple of minutes before each of those transitions to get over to your calendar system and talk about it. Um, It shouldn't just be, here, Sally, we're going to this place, let's go, and running out the door. Um, because that's really not giving them that processing time or that time to make the connection. So we want to make sure that we're taking a couple of minutes at every transition to go over what's coming, what happened. I I think I've probably said it 20 times already. Make sure the child is a participant. Um, They need to be as actively engaged in this process as they possibly can be. So If it's tactile, they need to have those things in their hand. Um, Again, avoiding manipulating the hands using hand over hand if they need physical support. Um, They need to hear about it. They need to talk about it and express themselves in any way that they can through the process. Listen to them. And I'm hoping some of these examples that I give you in a little bit are gonna be helpful for that. But sometimes our kids are gonna make changes on their own. They're gonna 
find an object that they feel is a better fit for an activity and that's okay. Um, they may start, I always laugh. I always say, you know, a kid is really connected with their calendar if they start taking items that they don't want to do and putting them in the finished basket or in the trash can. Um, and this really opens the door to negotiate and talk about things and figure out what it is that they might not like about that activity or to explain that there are sometimes things that we have to do. But look, we get through this activity and look what we get to do next, something that you really like. So um, so it's a really fun way to, to interact with a child and, and to have them be heard. Um, trust in the purpose, because sometimes it'll feel like a really slow process, but and it may seem like you're changing things and manipulating things often. And you might be depending on the student as you're trying to perfect the system. But once you get there, it's, it's a game changer for a lot of our kids in terms of communication. And the last thing is be consistent. And that's not just with our symbols, but that's with our language. Um, I work with a team and actually you'll see that student in a minute um, who we have the DeafBlind project and the school team and mom have regular conversations about what language is going to be used with each symbol, what sign they might use with each symbol. Um, so making sure that everybody on the team is implementing it exactly the same way using language and information that's accessible for that child as they're building those connections. So I did this a little differently last time. Usually I spend a lot of time on that first half, um, but I wanted, I know as a learner myself, when I get to see things in action, um, it makes it mean that much more to me. And so I wanted to give you two examples of students. Um, you may recognize TJ from his mom's presentation last week. He just turned 21. He has a diagnosis of a paroxysomal disorder and he is what I would call a total communicator. Um, TJ takes in information receptively auditorily using tactile sign. Um, <clears throat> using a little bit of vision and visual cues. So he uses a little bit of everything. And then expressively, he's got some verbalization. He uses some home signs and tactile signs. He uses these object cards. Um, so a plethora of all of these items. Um, in terms of his hearing, he has a cochlear implant on one side and a hearing aid on the other uh, and had degenerative loss over time and vision is a lot like retinitis pigmentosa um, in terms of field loss, light sensitivity, that kind of thing. So um, this is actually a quite old picture of TJ. This is probably about six years ago of him <laughs> working with his calendar system in school. And Marilyn, I hear you chiming in. Did you need to do a switch? Well, I know there's a few things, but um, um, Dana, if you get an opportunity after we do an interpreter switch, I saw some comments that were popping up um, in the chat box there so first let's go ahead and do an interpreter switch okay i saw katie who is tj's mom say that a kid that's really enjoying their calendar system will often jump ahead they might not <laughs> even put the other things in the finish box they might just go straight to the activity they want to do and as much as that might drive a teacher crazy man it's a dream come true for somebody who wants to communicate right <laughs> to be able to say i want to do this thing now um so this, these pictures here are of TJ, um, I believe these are his middle school setting. So this is his wall calendar. It's a Velcro system. Uh, you can see there's some sensory things. There's a ball for PE, a piece of a diaper for toileting or for diaper changes. So this is the system that was being used at home. And I know over time his systems have changed. So please, part of this is that I get to show you some of the progression, which is really cool. So this was his nighttime routine. Um, we had a foam letter for bath because he did use those in the bathtub. Uh, mom had a diaper, a piece of boxer shorts for getting dressed, his cochlear implant, toothbrushing, lotion, nasal spray. And what you can see here is um, TJ was originally on a box system with whole objects. And what, uh, in this picture, you can see we are using some things or mom is using things that are a little smaller, like the lotion bottle, because he's already built in that concept of that item itself. Uh, the same thing with the nose spray, it's just the cap as opposed to the entire bottle. But again, that's also what he probably encounters most. And so it makes really good sense. Um, and you can see above, there's actually sign language right above those so that uh, anybody who's with him in the house can also reinforce with sign. I do have this video. Um, this is TJ using his calendar system. Because he's 21 now and everything, I wanted to have respect for him. I've dropped the video down so I know it looks low but this is him engaging with his system. 
all done with your diaper. Good job. What's next? Uh, can you put your toy down? Thank you. What's next? Uh-oh. Do you need help? Good job. So I'm going to put a just a quick caveat here. So you saw TJ um, go. He found the thing that was on the very left. So he's you can tell he's used to the system. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to emphasize here is in implementation, especially if you're doing this in a school system, when we write goals, um, when I'm working with teams, I ask them to be very, very specific. And so I know TJ and I, I've seen him use his calendar system. So normally I would, but I want to make sure that if you're writing a goal, we want to build in a confirmation component. So for TJ, he found the boxer shorts and knew that he needed to go to his drawer and he's walking there. And so that's how I would write the goal. Um, child will identify four items from their calendar system by engaging in the activity that it represents by walking towards that area or by matching it to another item or an item on the door, wherever they're going. So you always wanna make sure there's a concrete way to measure whether they've actually understood the item or not. Um, again, for TJ in this situation, he had been using the system for a while, but we wanna make sure there's a way to say, it's not just identify, I never wanna see on a goal, we'll identify three items and leave it at that. We need to be very clear about what identification looks like for our kids um, who have more complex communication needs. These are some other examples of some of TJ's sensory cards. And so you can see this is a combination of some whole real items and some partial items and some miniature items that um, relate to things that he likes. So music was the iPhone because he liked music from his mom's phone. Um, we've got a full Lego block for blocks. There's a full little Ziploc container for potatoes, but it's a smaller version of the one that he usually uses. Um, the handles of his backpack. So very, very deliberate in choosing what his symbols are. And then when we talk about putting this into the educational com uh, component, um, we can use these things for the literacy skills like sequencing, which is often a goal for teachers. And so um, the pictures above says TJ is sequencing the cards for his meal prep routine. And so he's got his symbol cards that he's been, he's been using for a while. And if you see in the beginning, there's nothing on there and he's actually loading up the calendar in order or that activity and building that sequence. And so you'll see again, really deliberate choosing of his items. And so there's the handle for where he goes to get the food out. There's what looks like I'm assuming a grip, like the little Velcro grips that you might put on a spoon. Um, so that might be what he uses when he scoops his potatoes. The little uh, puff paint dots are probably, they mark, uh, match up with the microwave indicators for start and stop. So we have the top of a jar for his gravy and then maybe that built up handle for stirring. So very, very uh, individualized, unique items. I also wanna go on to say that there are systems available um, for making like a universal system for students. And those are phenomenal for students who have those abstract concepts. And so, um, there may be a mix, you may use a mix of the universal symbols and these customized symbols to introduce them to something so that maybe across settings, it's a little bit more generalized, but I would always say when we're starting from the beginning, we want to make it pretty individualized to know that we can build those concepts and then we might build out. Um, this next pictures uh, are again of TJ. So TJ is in a little swimming pool in his backyard and you can see they made a little, uh, I, sorry, a symbol with a pool noodle, just a cut piece of pool noodle. And I'm gonna follow this up with a video in just a second, but you can tell that swimming is a motivating activity for him. He's pretty happy in there. Um, and then the next one is when we made, or when mom made an item for playground. And so that's the chain of the swing that he would hold on to. Uh, and that's him engaging with it and learning about it. The video that I'm gonna show next here, excuse the quality because I Facebook doesn't allow you to download things, but I do have permission, I promise. Um, this is actually when we talk about building communication, TJ had a swimming pool card and he wanted to be able to, you know, if that item was not in his direct reach, he wanted to be able to talk about it more. So he created a sign for it 
And the cool thing about having the object card was that it was, it's a way that he can confirm that that's what he was trying to tell his parents. And so um, this is a video that mom had posted a while ago of him with a sign for swimming. Swimming pool, good job. Go, go, go. I know you're excited. Swimming pool. And you can see- Good he, job, TJ. He does the sign again. So he's holding the object for swimming pool and then showing the sign that he's created um, that works for him. And so again, all of our students are unique. Um, in TJ's case, signs that involve two hands beyond the body without touching either another hand if it's all open space are much more difficult for him. So a lot of the times he'll modify or mom and school team will modify to be something tactual or touching somebody else for him to be able to independently create that sign. But I just, this is one of my favorite examples of the calendar system being just a springboard to more communication. <laughs> And then as TJ's gotten older, some of his things have changed. So this is a portable system for him. Um, it doesn't necessarily go in order. This is maybe for choice making um, for some sensory activities. So we've got some smaller symbols. They're on one of those just little carabiner hooks um, and that his teacher or his intervener or TJ can carry with him or it can hook on to his gate trainer or walker if he needs it. Um, but just another way that once he started to build that meaning that we could start taking these things on the go for additional communication. Um, and then I know uh, I wanna hit transition a little bit. And so again, I'm gonna emphasize the fact that TJ is 21 and he's been getting some work experience. And so these are some calendar symbols that go along with his work activities. So this calendar system is not just for little kids. This can be for anybody who could use that type of support. Um, so we have in this symbol, the left one is backpack buddies. And that's the, you know, the milk crates that are plastic. It's a piece of that because that's the piece that he holds usually when he's helping um, fill up the backpacks. The next one is the car wash air freshener, which he handed out at the car wash that he worked at, but it's also scented. So again, using all of the modalities. Um, and the next one is recycling on the right there. And that's just ripped up different pieces of cardboard stacked up, but again, all meaningful to the activities that he's completing. Um, and again, you can see that evolution. So that first picture and video was probably when he was about 15 or 16. Uh, and now we're 21 and we're looking at smaller symbols, more portable symbols, work related symbols. Um, so there's really, there's no, there's no boundary to what you can actually use these, these kinds of modes of communication for. And the last part of TJ, this is him in his high school classroom and about to do a work task. And so his teacher is going through some of the work tasks with him to solidify that. So I'm going to go ahead and play that. What should you do today? Should you get the mail? She's trying to say that she can't see. Shred. Go to the cafeteria. Or deliver packages. Yeah, you're good. I would like you to get the mail. Can you get the mail today? Yeah. Thank you. Get it, get it, get it. You're welcome. So that was again TJ looking through the work tasks. Um, you can tell he knew what to expect with the flipping of the rings. Um, his teacher did a pretty beautiful job of using hand under hand as much as possible to manipulate through that. Um, that's his intervener. And um, again, when we talk about that confirmation, as soon as he's given that task, he will start to move towards the direction of what he's supposed to be doing next. Um, again, this is something that he solidified over time, but I, something I just like to caution teams about is that we need to just have a really concrete of, way of knowing that we've acquired that information, that we, we are identifying those symbols. Hey, Krista, this is <laughs> Yes. Sorry. Did you see um, Katie had said that the portable system can and has been used for work related to be able to ask his teacher, what am I supposed to do next? And that it would carry over to an employer also. I did not see that, but that, so Katie is TJ's mom. So she gets yeah. to add all that extra information, which is super helpful. So thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, so 
that's that portable <laughs> system has really evolved over time, which has been really, really nice. And again, we started with the picture of the boxes in the very beginning of this presentation. That's where he started was with full boxes and full items. And now we're at a place where we're putting things on a ring. Um, I say we, it's really his school team and mom. Um, but And they're able to go into different environments and he's really understanding what's going on. Another, Krista, another um, comment that, Craig, that Katie said that I think is so important for us to also remember is that um, she had said that we have always had to be very careful about using smaller versions. Example, a small bus would not connect the actual bus for him. A small chair would not connect as an actual chair he sits in. The smaller bowl was a rare time we could do this. Um, I think another example of that in TJ's case was um, for his feeding tube, they do liquids with a big syringe. And so originally they started with a large syringe and then it was sized down to a smaller one once they knew that the understanding was there. So, and I'm so happy Katie's on because for my professionals on the call that are, you know, in the education world um, or even in the therapy world, can you tell how much family input is helpful <laughs> just by Katie's additional comments? Um, so again, use, use your family as their resource, as your partner, because they are going to be able to help decide what's meaningful for that child. I know we've had several conversations where we've been trying to choose a texture and we find out, oh no, we're using something similar, similar to that at home for this activity. So this may be confusing. Um, and we want to avoid that confusion for our kids as much as possible if we can. So thank you again, Katie, for chiming in here and there. Um, the next kiddo that we're going to look at is Andrew, um, and you will, if you have not met his mom, you will see her soon on some webinars, <laughs> but Andrew is 17, soon to be 18, um, is diagnosed with CHARGE syndrome, and you're going to notice that I use total communicator for both of them, and they're both very different communicators, and I will say that that's because my definition of total communicator means we look at all of the options that are available um, and accessible, and we give them all as much as we can, you know, in a very careful way or a very deliberate way. Um, and we see what works. And then if a child is taking advantage of all the things that work for them, to me, that's total communication. <laughs> they're using every tool that they have in their toolbox to make sure that they're getting understood and that they're understanding what's happening in their world. So um, for Andrew, again, we have the diagnosis of CHARGE syndrome. He does have the colobomas in his eyes. Um, he has some field issues in terms of uh, travel. Some of the lower field is affected. And then bilateral hearing aids um, in the past. And I, he's transferred settings. And I'm pretty sure they probably still use it occasionally. But um, he was using an FM system in the past. I think he probably still uses that now. So um, a couple of different supports. He is a verbal communicator. Uh, he will also write or type or use pictures to support that. Um, receptively, he usually uses uh, auditory with sign support. So um, usually he uses that visual cue to help him understand what's being said. So this is Andrew at his class in middle school a couple of years ago. And you'll see, again, I'm hoping to show some evolution of these things. He's got a folder on his desk or a binder that has Velcro little cards in front of him. And so that was one of his calendar systems that he used at that time. So Andrew is a little different than TJ in that he wants as much information and as much upfront as he could possibly get. And so these are just some examples of very informal kind of systems where maybe the teacher wrote what the day looked like. There were times, and I will show you that there might be four typed pages of the daily schedule but that's the information that he needed to be able to prepare himself for those transitions for the day. Um, and I guess that's not something that I really spoke about earlier, but the one beautiful piece of calendar systems is if you know something is coming, then you can prep yourself for it. So I always jokingly give the example, if I know I have a dentist appointment, um, I'm gonna floss a little bit better you know, before I go because I need to prepare, you know? so. You want to give our kids the opportunity in whatever mode that they're comfortable with to be able to mentally prepare for what's going to happen. So the left picture is a handwritten calendar of steps throughout the day. On the right side is that binder with the pull-off cards. Um, they're all handwritten. Depending on the child's access level, um, I typically prefer a typed version of these kinds of things or a more formal version. But if this works, again, for your kid, 
or if they want to help make the symbols. No judgment here. Again, flexibility is key with a calendar system. This is the example that I was telling you about next. So this was um, a more formalized version of that calendar for Andrew. So this was his full day and he could check off as he went along. Um, again, three full pages, but this helped him to prepare for what was coming. Um, so Andrew has transitioned to a new setting. And in this picture on the top left, you'll see that there is an already made calendar for him um, in print up on that blue board. And then below that there's, it's light writing, but there's a, some bold line paper that he's written on. And so what I love about this example and what you see on the right is kind of a laminated version of what he's written there on the bottom. And it's enforcing the idea of writing full sentences based on something that's motivating for him. So for Andrew, the calendar is motivation. So for him, he goes through and he gets to review his day. And then he, as the educational skill has to write what those activities are as a full sentence. Um, so a really cool way to enforce literacy skills through the calendar system. And this is Andrew actually doing that. And you'll hear more of his teacher in this and I'll give you the reason why I wanted to share this example, but this is him doing that process. Can you read me the first three things? I know I have the I have the and I have the, oh, can you use a nice, and, clear voice? And, and, uh, so I included this example because, like I had mentioned before, this is a great place to incorporate more than just literacy skills, more than just time skills. You can incorporate your therapies and things into this. So you heard his teacher prompt him, can you use a nice, clear voice? And that is often one of his speech goals. And so we can build in all of these extra strategies into this one activity. There we go. And this is another example. So we talked about kind of routines within, um, and this is him at his private physical therapy session. Um, his PT was fantastic and had gone to several charge conferences. And so learned a little bit more about these calendar systems or structured systems and started creating excuse me, this manipulative, kind of system that he could move the activities around. So it was really, um, I think, motivating for him. And again, he knew what to expect. And the cool thing in this video you'll see, and again, sorry about the quality here, is they're at, she's asking him to place the items in the order that he wants to do it. Um, so that structured system is also giving him some level of control. Mm. What does that say? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yes, please choose five. That stays, that stays on the top. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Good. <laughs> Um, and a few things that I love about this video, I love that his PT um, incorporated a schedule into her, her days with him. Um, I love the processing time. So again, the calendar is a great place to reinforce some of those skills. So she gave him plenty of time to read all of his options with maybe just a verbal prompt that reminded him that he was in control. And for anybody who has felt out of control at all, even in their own regular scheduled day, you know how important that is to be able to choose what order you do things can sometimes mean everything. And so I love that component of it as well. So that was, I think something that she has continued to develop, to develop over time with him. And then I wanted to give some examples. So um, 
then we moved into distance learning and calendar systems in the traditional way kind of went out the door um, for a lot of families and teachers. And so this is um, an example of um, what his teacher was sending home for him to do virtual lessons. And so it included rules and steps for what he was supposed to complete at home. So um, the first one says, use my clear speaking voice and talk slowly, have safe hands, communicate what I want, do work, and then a doodle break. When I'm finished, say, I want to hang up, please, and then say goodbye and mash the button. So it's a step-by-step, -step, but it's built in social skills. So how cool is that, um, that they've gotten that? And so it's also, you know, we're learning a whole new world with this technology and with virtual learning. And so it's giving him a really structured way to engage in that. Um, so I thought that was a really cool example of how his calendars have evolved over time. This is him in some of his workstations. And so the left, he is making like ribbon mats and you can see there's a yellow box on the top left and there's like a little yellow line on the top and that is step-by-step step to complete that activity. So again, looking at transition, how do we build calendars into transition? Since Andrew is primarily a visual learner, um, most of his things are presented in print and you can see this is dry erase or something that they can wipe off and he's able to check the boxes as he finishes. Same thing with the picture on the right. And that's just a general picture, but it's one of his work activities is to make dog biscuits. And so that's a um, the ring version. So he can just flip through the steps. But again, when we look at that broad idea of calendar systems, this is a really good way to build in expectations through an activity in a very concrete way. And this is the last one for Andrew. And this is something that his mom did. He again, really likes structure. Um, and in the past has engaged and occasionally will engage in self-interest behaviors, um, especially when the expectations aren't clear or there's frustration. And so, you know, mom needed to get some stuff done. And so she created him a little calendar system of just free time activities that he could do and he could check them off. And for him, again, that's a feeling of control. And so many of our kids want the communication and they want control over what they're doing. And so this gave him that. So just some different examples of ways that people have thought outside the box to make a calendar system work. Um, again, with the main purpose, of course, of increasing communication. And I wanted to shoot just a big thank you to the Sacker and the Delaney Lambert families for letting me share their kids with everybody. Um, they're just such wonderful examples of how uh, calendar system could start and evolve over time to build so many concepts and communication strategies for our kids. That is the end of my content. I think I sped through the first half a little faster than I intended to make sure that I got to the kids. Um, but I am open for questions. Um, I see a lot of thank yous and that they love the examples. I tried to include as many real life examples because I really wanted to make sure that you could see it in action. I know I could sit and listen to stories about concepts forever, but to actually see them working um, and to see them benefiting a student certainly is, it lets me be more inclined to want to explore it and try it a little bit more. There is no wrong way to, I mean, I guess there could be some wrong ways, but there's no wrong way to get a start, whether that be just making the phone call to your team um, and saying, hey, I'd like to give this a try to just starting to brainstorm what a schedule looks like for your kid. Um, it's never too late to start either. Like we said with um, with TJ, he's 21 now, but really, and Katie, correct me if I'm wrong, that calendar system didn't really get put into place until he was about 13 or 14. Um, and so communication is important to kids no matter when they start it. And the one thing I think that Katie learned was the more that TJ learned how to communicate, the more he expected other people to be able to communicate with him, which could certainly be frustrating, but also be extremely rewarding in the sense that he feels heard and understands that he wants to be understood. Lana had a great question. She said, how do you represent therapy time? Do you use the person's name symbol or something to represent the therapy? Ah. Great question. And so um, there are several ways that people do this. And again, um, it's really dependent upon the schedule and the team and how things are set up. Oftentimes, if it's in a school setting, I will say, unless you've had a PT that's been there for 20 years and you know she's not going anywhere and will be continuing to serve your child, um, I would always go with the 
um, item to represent the activity over the person with the activity, um, only because that'll help make it consistent across settings. Having said that, um, there's no reason to not pair the person with the activity. So if you wanna do some ID symbols, or if it is somebody who's really, really consistent, um, if you're, you know, in terms of not therapy related, but if you're going to grandma's house, you may just have a symbol for grandma that represents both her and the location um, and whatever they're doing. So it's again, flexible and it's gonna be dependent upon your team and what you think is going to work. Um, if your child is super motivated to go to occupational therapy because they love their OT, you might wanna pick an identifier for the OT to start that off just to build the meaning um, and then expand out from there. I know in some circumstances, um, people will use a calendar system where it's the activity and then the person that's doing it with them side by side. So um, it really, again, it depends on your team, but I'm, I think being open to all of the ideas is the best way to approach it and not being afraid to go, well, this failed, let's try something different. <laughs> Because what I always say as far as death blind projects go is, you know, we're, we're not working directly with our kids half the time. And so a lot of the times we want to make sure, you know, we're throwing a lot of things at the wall and we know that not all of it's going to stick um, as long as we kind of keep trying and we communicate and we stay working together as a team, we can usually find something that works. And Katie had just said um, personal identifiers help help us communicate on the calendar about the person coming to work with TJ. And so he does have some personal identifiers. Um, I did not throw the example in there, but his teacher, the visually impaired, actually uses her personal identifier as his symbol for the time with her, but it's also interactive. So she's got a little mini flashlight. And when she comes, he takes that symbol off and, or she's wearing it and he engages with it. And then he turns it on just when they're starting their session and he turns it off when they're finished. And then he goes back to his calendar system. So super creative ways to embed that kind of information um, within the system. I see it. Do the children remember the information? Um, when you are looking at the calendar systems, because you are going to be very deliberate in what you're choosing and how you're introducing it, um, typically our kids do remember those things. Again, it there's no time frame for it. So it may take one kid a week to make the connection with something, and it may take them three months. Or you may find at three weeks that this is the wrong symbol and we need to change it up. Um, but with consistency and a lot of teamwork, I've never seen it be unsuccessful in terms of a child making that connection. I've certainly seen unsuccessful calendar systems, but that's because they haven't been implemented with consistency and fidelity. So um, just keeping that in mind that that team approach is really, really important. And Katie's asking me to remind everybody that overwhelmed, um, part that if you're doing a lot at once, it's going to overwhelm the kid too, and also overwhelm you, which will make it less effective. And she was saying as a mom, she needed to hear that. And um, there was a, for the recall information for the children, did I not, did I misunderstand the question? I'm sorry. Oh, so how do they retell it? So that's actually a great question. And so um, Robbie Bleha, who wrote the calendars book, talks about um, once we start making those connections to symbols, um, any symbol system, we make it available to the child. And so if a child is looking to talk about some of these objects or an activity that they did, they might, um, you might create a word wall. So remember when I said, make sure that you can have multiples of things, um, you may have your calendar system and you may have a whole word wall of all of the things that are on there that they can go to, to bring it to you. Um, or like TJ, he made up a sign that he could use on the spot for an item that he was familiar with. Um, so yeah, there are different ways that they can recall it. Again, doing that end of the day review, if you're just starting to introduce like a weekly or a daily calendar system and going through what has been finished and giving them access to all of those cards. Um, I know as TJ started to develop some signs, he would, um, use them to kind of recall information as well that he was pairing with his word wall and mom just said she'll he'll take her to the word wall to get his point across if he thinks that she's not understanding him so it's an extra support piece um but having that vocabulary once they make those connections available for them to have spontaneously or pairing it with language or signs um, can be very very helpful again krista thank you so much and i love seeing our guys up there 
uh, especially just watching them over the last, you know, several years now where they where they've been and where they're heading. Uh, so much success ahead. Everybody, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you, Katie, for being here and helping us and filtering through the, all these great, great questions. So, I think that's it. Thank you all for coming.